now we have uh, uh, a topic that is second law of thermodynamics and uh, uh, in this uh, lecture we will discuss uh, the second law of thermodynamics and its application implication in details uh, for instance we uh, have two uh, major key components of machinery uh, that uh, is uh, widely used in thermodynamic system first is uh, the heat engine and that uh, and second one is heat pump heat engine is uh, an engine that produces a mechanical output uh, and um, that can the output that can be used uh, to drive uh, a certain machinery or car or certain uh, getting certain physical output um, and uh, it is uh, operated on a heat source any engine that operates on a heat source is known as a heat engine it includes a steam engine, it includes an internal engine, sterling engine, whatever it is. Uh, if it operates on a heat source to produce a mechanical output, it is a heat engine. Then the second one is heat pump. Heat pumps, uh, heat pumps are uh, a, a machine or you say that uh, it's, a, it's a combination of machine elements that moves the heat and that moves the heat from lower temperature to higher temperature when provided with the physical uh, mechanical input energy if you provide work to it uh, you will be getting uh, a heat flow from lower temperature reservoir to higher temperature reservoir for instance uh, ACs uh, air conditioning units are installed at your home or refrigerators uh, and other chilling uh, 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 chilling plants uh, like uh, those one uh, you have already visited in uh, in the industry the chiller plants that moves the heat from lower temperature reservoir to higher temperature reservoir to make a lower temperature wire, uh, reservoir even uh, cold uh, than uh, than the uh, than, uh, than it was on the previous instant. So this is uh, known as a uh, heat pump. Uh, AI, uh, for example, uh, if you put some food in your uh, refrigerator and it is a hot summer uh, day, uh, you will uh, you will find it the food uh, at a much lower temperature after uh, after some time uh, than you have placed it in. Even though the food was uh, uh, not that much hot as it was the ambience uh, because it was a hot summer day and let's suppose that we have 50 degree or 45 degree centigrade um, day temperature. So uh, you, you cook the food, you place, uh, you place it on um, the shelf for a certain time, it will cool down to room temperature and um, uh, then if you put it in a refrigerator, it will cool down to a further lower temperatures. Uh, and uh, your refrigerator is uh, a heat pump so it pumps the heat from your food out of your food and pumps it into the higher temperature reservoir that is ambient that is already hot that is was 45 degrees centigrade it was a hot summer day already so uh, it moves the heat from from low temperature and in the direction of higher temperature so this is exactly opposite to the nature in if you uh, if you uh, consider how naturally heat transfer it always moves from high temperature reservoir to lower temperature reservoir because uh, it always uh, moves uh, in a direction to make the system uh, to, to to move the system toward lower energies so if you uh, that that is more uh, that is more sustainable without any uh, external input for instance, you uh, put a hot cup of tea uh, on a table and uh, you will observe that and you have already observed that it will cool down to room temperature and uh, it was hot so now uh, uh, now heat is uh, moving from uh, the cup of uh, tea from cup of tea to the environment you know uh, so the net result is more sustainable because the uh, the uh, the resultant system is uh, is at much lower energy level uh, than it was uh, previously when the uh, cup, for, um, cup was hot uh, uh, with a uh, boiling water inside it. <clears throat> so system always move in the direction of lower energies 
Uh, therefore, if you want to move the heat in opposite direction from low temperature reservoir to high temperature reservoir, you will have to add in certain work and uh, your refrigerators at your home take this work in the form of energy, electrical energy. That electrical energy drives the motor, motor drives the compressor and uh, compressor compresses the gas, uh, refrigerant gas uh, in, the, in, the, in the circuit and uh, it uh, uh, and we will discuss uh, the its uh, complete detail in the coming slides. So you have to put in electrical energy if you don't switch off the refrigerator, then there will be no electrical energy flowing into the system, and you will not be providing the system the desired energy uh, that will uh, that was required to to conduct the process uh, that was the uh, pumping the heat from low temperature reservoir to high temperature reservoir. Therefore. Now you have to put in some work uh, if you want to move heat in opposite direction, opposite to the nature. Uh, hence, these two are the uh, main, comp main, main uh, you can uh, say, the processes, the heat engine and heat pump, that is uh, widely discussed in thermodynamics. And uh, we can make uh, things, we can make processes uh, using these uh, components. And uh, therefore, we will be discussing it in this slide. Now we talk about the thermal efficiency of heat engines and how do we calculate it. Let us assume that uh, there is a uh, high temperature reservoir and uh, there is a low temperature reservoir as mentioned in this slide. If we have a uh, uh, high temperature reservoir, for instance, uh, we have a combustion chamber and internal combustion engines. We put in fuel and it burns out in the, the combustion chamber. So there is high temperature and combustion chamber. We say at a high temperature reservoir. And then there is a radiator that radiates the heat from engine to the environment, to the air. And uh, we say that the temperature of radiator is much more lower than the temperature at high temperature reservoir. That was the combustion chamber. So the radiator is the low temperature reservoir. We feed in the uh, heat and uh, heat move from high temperature reservoir to the engine. Now uh, some of this heat is converted into the useful output mechanical uh, energy that is work and the remaining, remaining is uh, dissipated to the low temperature reservoir. This is the main uh, functional diagram of the heat engine. The uh, heat engine also includes steam engine, like as um, uh, as uh, presented in the figure above. We input the uh, uh, heat in the form of uh, fire uh, or any other uh, high temperature as well, like uh, uh, nuclear reactions that uh, generate high temperatures. And we use this temperature and this energy to uh, boil up the water and uh, get the superheated steam. Now this steam is uh, uh, now this uh, steam goes into the turbine and runs the turbine. Tur turbine give out some of the work and uh, pass on the remaining energy uh, to the uh, condenser. Uh, that condenses the steam back into the water uh, liquid form and then we pump it back into the uh, boiler. So this is the uh, this is the process, the recycling process that takes place in a, uh, in a steam engine. So therefore, uh, uh, we can uh, conclude that uh, uh, we input some energy and this uh, some of part of this energy is uh, converted into uh, into the uh, mechanical useful work and the remaining is dissipated into the environment. So the, uh, the, uh, the schematic diagram is uh, shown in the lower uh, right uh, corner. Now we can, uh, we can just simply uh, apply uh, uh, the law of conservation of energy and uh, we can say that uh, the work is the difference of input energy and the rejected energy. Uh, the energy that uh, is uh, being dissipated to the uh, low temperature reservoir is, uh, is called rejected energy. So uh, we can say that work uh, is the work is difference, the work output is difference of energies 
um, different of uh, energies uh, uh, that is coming from higher temperature is where QL uh, minus QL uh, QH higher temperature energy coming from the higher temperature reservoir and uh, we subtract QL uh, the rejected energy from the higher energy coming from the uh, higher temperature reservoir and uh, this uh, give us out the uh, um, out the work so it is uh, it is quite simple that uh, the uh, we have uh, two uh, uh, two outputs uh, and one input uh, or the sum of output must be equal to the input this is law of conservation of energy so uh, we uh, said that uh, w plus ql is equal to qh and uh, which results into w is equal to kh minus ql so uh, but what is the efficiency efficiency is the output over input so our output of the system is work which is qh minus ql and input of the system is qh energy is coming from high temperature as well so efficiency if you calculate the efficiency output divided by input that is work divided by the energy coming from high temperature reservoir it, 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 it turns out and it simplifies into this form the thermal efficiency of an engine is equal to 1 minus QL divided by QH you must uh, uh, remember that this is the thermal efficiency this is not the mechanical efficiency so it might be it might not include the losses because of friction and other um, other uh, parasitic uh, losses that happens in a machinery so thermal efficiency uh, might always be equal or more than the mechanical efficiency and uh, it it is use, it it in usually uh, always remain higher than the mechanical efficiency because it does not include the frictional and other losses that that surely happen in a mechanical setup so therefore the thermal efficiency uh, is equal to of an, an engine heat engine is equal to 1 minus q h q l divided by q h we you have been observing that there is a dot over it so we can derivate the equation with respect to time and we can get the answer in uh, in power so there is a power that we feed into the machinery and we get break of power at the engine uh, crankshaft uh, and there is some uh, rate of energy uh, that is at which the energy is being uh, dissipated to low temperature as well so if we derivate it uh, all of these energies uh, get the form of power and uh, we can use also uh, this um, uh, this form of the uh, formulation uh, and calculate the thermal efficiency we can use both in the form of energies and we can use uh, the power formulation as well now we have a problem that a car engine uh, delivers a 136 horsepower to the drive shaft uh, with a thermal efficiency of 30 percent the fuel burns at the release it uh, uh, the fuel burns and it releases uh, 35,000 kilojoules per kg of energy uh, if, if it means that if one kg of fuel burns out it gives 35,000 kilojoules of energy to the engine find the total rate of heat rejection to the ambience and the rate of fuel combu combustion in the uh, kgs per second uh, so uh, we uh, we already know that the uh, if we want to convert the horsepower uh, into the watts uh, we mul uh, multiply it with uh, three seven thirty five point five watts per per horsepower and we can get the um, the output that we already know in the form of horsepower that was thirty six horsepower and now we have converted it into the a 100 kilowatt power that engine delivers at its uh, crankshaft now since we know that um, thermal efficiency is equal to 1 minus ql dot over qh dot and we know the thermal efficiency we know the thermal efficiency and uh, we um, just uh, simply uh, uh, 
use the form w dot over q s dot so now we have w dot known our thermal efficiency is known so we can find the q s dot as well from this formulation and uh, uh, now we have uh, since we have q h and uh, we can find the q l uh, because uh, q w is dot is equal to q h minus q l dot so we know the work our uh, the power output we know now the because of the information of uh, thermal efficiency we know that what is q h and now we can find this ql dot so uh, we have already found this ql dot uh, this it is action led to the ambient now what we want to find that uh, uh, since uh, we already know know that the specific uh, energy for a uh, fuel is uh, is already given that is 35000 kilojoules of energy per kg if a, if a 1 kg of energy burns out then 35 kilojoules of energy uh, comes out so we can uh, divide the rate of uh, rate of the energy flowing from high temperature wire to the engine that is ql uh, qh dot divided by the specific energy and we can find the mass flow rate of the fuel that is required to run the engine in order to get one 100 kilowatts of uh, power at its, um, its, its crankshaft so and therefore we divided the rate at which uh, qh uh, is flowing into the system divided by specific uh, in energy of the fuel and we get the uh, mass flow rate of the fuel as our result now we have refrigeration cycle and uh, refrigeration cycle is uh, is nearly opposite uh, to the heat pump in the heat pump uh, ref uh, sorry is uh, is opposite to heat engine in heat engine we uh, input the energy and we get uh, uh, the work output in the refrigeration cycle we input the work and we get the flow of energy so it's exactly opposite and you can see over here in the form of this schematic diagram that that the uh, heat is now flowing from low temperature reservoir to high temperature reservoir you see this and uh, it is moving to the room temperature that is already at elevated temperature as compared to this refrigerator refrigerator the compartment inside the refrigerator is uh, uh, you already know that it keeps the food at a temperature that is lower than the room temperature so the compartment temperature is already lower than the room temperature but Uh, even then the heat is moving from the compartment to the room to and room which is ambient to the ambient to this environment uh, to the system so it is exactly opposite to the uh, heat engine in which we uh, heat in which heat flows from high temperature reservoir to low temperature reservoir and we get the work output here we input the work and heat moves from low temperature reservoir to high temperature reservoir so uh, it is a, uh, again we apply the law of conservation of energy and we get this uh, uh, work uh, which is uh, work is equal to qh minus ql and uh, since the, the aim of the refrigerator is to maintain the low temperature reservoir to maintain the flow of heat this flow of heat from compartment to the ambient uh, now our aim is to maintain this ql dot so this is our output and our input is equal to work uh, so we divide ql minus qw and we know that w is equal to qh minus ql so this is uh, 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 this is efficiency of the refrigerator but we call it uh, coefficient of performance cop so we call it coefficient of performance in case of uh, in case of refrigerators um, and um, it is uh, it is it is particularly thermal efficiency for this uh, particular case but its name is coefficient of performance 
So whenever we find the efficiency of a refrigerator, we talk about coefficient of performances. So uh, that's why uh, it is uh, it is abbreviated here as a COP coefficient of performance. So if we consider any uh, the circuit diagram of the uh, of the refrigerator. We will we will come to know uh, that we input this mechanical out mechanical work to this compressor shaft in the form of motor. We supply energy to motor. If we can draw over here, here is motor. And motor is coupled with this shaft. We apply. We flow current through this motor. As a result, this shaft rotates. This uh, shaft rotates. Motor uh, shaft of the motor is coupled with the uh, shaft of the compressor, and that's why it drives the compressor. It input the energy into the compressor. Compressor compresses the gas and send it into the comp uh, condenser. And now, after uh, going through the condenser, it uh, even uh, liquefies, uh, and uh, quality already reduced uh, because of the compressor. Uh, so, the condenser is used to further liquefy it and uh, liquefy the condensed gas. Then, condensed gas is moved into the expansion valve. An expansion valve uh, uh, or a capillary tube, and it expands inside the compartment in a ev evaporator. Okay, expansion valve releases the gas into the evaporator. So, evaporator in our case uh, is installed inside the uh, inside the refrigerator compartment. If you remove the uh, the covering from the uh, refrigerator compartment, you will see that there is another coil that you can uh, inside a refrigerator. This is, this is the evaporator coil. The capillary tube slowly releases gas into the evaporator. At, uh, and this sudden expansion from compressed liquid gas to again a saturated vapors uh, results in cooling effect. On the basis of the matter considered in the previous slides, we are now ready to state the second law of thermodynamics. There are two classical statements of the second law, known as the Kelvin-Planck statement and the Clausius statement. The Kelvin-Planck statement it is impossible to construct a device that will operate in a cycle and produce no effect other than the raising of a weight and the exchange of heat with a single reservoir. See the first figure. This statement ties in with our discussion of the heat engine. In effect, it states that it is impossible to construct a heat engine that operates in a cycle, receives a given amount of heat from a high temperature body, and does an equal amount of work. The only alternative is that some heat must be transferred from the working fluid at a lower temperature to a low temperature body. Thus, work can be done by the transfer of heat only if there are two temperature levels, and heat is transferred from the high temperature body to the heat engine and also from the heat engine to the low temperature body. This implies that it is impossible to build a heat engine that has a thermal efficiency of 100%. The Clausius Statement it is impossible to construct a device that operates in a cycle and produces no effect other than the transfer of heat from a cooler body to a warmer body. See the second figure. This statement is related to the refrigerator or heat pump. In effect, it states that it is impossible to construct a refrigerator that operates without an input of work. This also implies that the coefficient of performance is always less than infinity. Three observations should be made about these two statements. The first observation is that both are negative statements. It is, of course, impossible to prove these negative statements. However, we can say that the second law of thermodynamics, like every other law of nature, rests on experimental evidence. Every relevant experiment that has been conducted, either directly or indirectly, verifies the second law.
and no experiment has ever been conducted that contradicts the second law. The basis of the second law is, therefore, experimental evidence. A second observation is that these two statements of the second law are equivalent. Two statements are equivalent if the truth of either statement implies the truth of the other or if the violation of either statement implies the violation of the other. That a violation of a Clausius statement implies a violation of the Kelvin-Planck statement may be shown. The device in the figure is a refrigerator that requires no work and thus violates the Clausius statement. Let an amount of heat QL be transferred from the low temperature reservoir to this refrigerator, and let the same amount of heat QL be transferred to the high temperature reservoir. Let an amount of heat QH that is greater than QL be transferred from the high temperature reservoir to the heat engine, and let the engine reject the amount of heat QL as it does an amount of work, W, that equals QH minus QL. Because there is no net heat transfer to the low temperature reservoir, the low temperature reservoir, along with the heat engine and the refrigerator, can be considered together as a device that operates in a cycle and produces no effect other than the raising of a weight, work, and the exchange of heat with a single reservoir. Thus, a violation of the Clausius statement implies a violation of the Kelvin-Planck statement. The complete equivalence of these two statements is established when it is also shown that a violation of the Kelvin-Planck statement implies a violation of the Clausius statement. This is left as an exercise for the student. The third observation is that frequently the second law of thermodynamics has been stated as the impossibility of constructing a perpetual motion machine of the second kind. A perpetual motion machine of the first kind would create work from nothing or create mass or energy thus violating the first law. A perpetual motion machine of the second kind would extract heat from a source and then convert this heat completely into other forms of energy, thus violating the second law. A perpetual motion machine of the third kind would have no friction, and thus would run indefinitely but produce no work. A heat engine that violated the second law could be made into a perpetual motion machine of the second kind by taking the following steps. Consider figure 5.11, which might be the power plant of a ship. An amount of heat QL is transferred from the ocean to a high temperature body by means of a heat pump. The work required is W underscore, and the heat transferred to the high temperature body is heat from high temperature reservoir. Let the same amount of heat be transferred to a heat engine that violates the Kelvin-Planck statement of the second law and does an amount of work is equal to heat from high temperature reservoir. Of this work, an amount heats from high temperature and low temperature reservoirs is required to drive the heat pump, leaving the network available for driving the ship. Thus, we have a perpetual motion machine in the sense that work is done by utilizing freely available sources of energy such as the ocean or atmosphere. The question that can now logically be posed is this, if it is impossible to have a heat engine of 100% efficiency, what is the maximum efficiency one can have? The first step in the answer to this question is to define an ideal process, which is called a reversible process. A reversible process for a system is defined as a process that, once having taken place, can be reversed and in so doing leave no change in either system or surroundings. Let us illustrate the significance of this definition for a gas contained in a cylinder that is fitted with a piston. Consider the first figure in which a gas, which we define as the system, is restrained at high pressure by a piston that is secured by a pin. When the pin is removed, the piston is raised and forced abruptly against the stops. Some work is done by the system, since the piston has been raised a certain amount. Suppose we wish to restore the system to its initial state. One way of doing this would be to exert a force on the piston and thus compress the gas until the pin can be reinserted in the piston. Since the pressure on the face of the piston is greater on the return stroke than on the initial stroke, the work done on the gas in this reverse process is greater than the work done by the gas in the initial process. An amount of heat must be transferred from the gas during the reverse stroke so that the system has the same internal energy as it had originally. Thus, the system is restored to its initial state but the surroundings have changed by virtue of the fact that work was required to force the piston down and heat was transferred to the surroundings. The initial process therefore is an irreversible one because it could not be reversed without leaving a change in the surroundings. 
In second figure, let the gas in the cylinder comprise the system, and let the piston be loaded with a number of weights. Let the weights be slid off horizontally, one at a time, allowing the gas to expand and do work in raising the weights that remain on the piston. As the size of the weights is made smaller and their number is increased, we approach a process that can be reversed, for at each level of the piston during the reverse process there will be a small weight that is exactly at the level of the platform and thus can be placed on the platform without requiring work. In the limit, therefore, as the weights become very small, the reverse process can be accomplished in such a manner that both the system and its surroundings are in exactly the same state they were in initially. Such a process is a reversible process. There are many factors that make processes irreversible. Four of those factors, friction, unrestrained expansion, heat transfer through a finite temperature difference, and mixing of two different substances, are considered. Friction It is readily evident that friction makes a process irreversible, but a brief illustration may amplify the point. Let a block and an inclined plane make up a system and let the block be pulled up the inclined plane by weights that are lowered. A certain amount of work is needed to do this. Some of this work is required to overcome the friction between the block and the plane, and some is required to increase the potential energy of the block. The block can be restored to its initial position by removing some of the weights and thus allowing the block to slide back down the plane. Some heat transfer from the system to the surroundings will no doubt be required to restore the block to its initial temperature. Since the surroundings are not restored to their initial state at the conclusion of the reverse process, we conclude that friction has rendered the process irreversible. Another type of frictional effect is that associated with the flow of viscous fluids in pipes and passages and in the movement of bodies through viscous fluids, unrestrained expansion. The classic example of an unrestrained expansion, as shown in figure 5.15, is a gas separated from a vacuum by a membrane. Consider what happens when the membrane breaks and the gas fills the entire vessel. It can be shown that this is an irreversible process by considering what would be necessary to restore the system to its original state. The gas would have to be compressed and heat transferred from the gas until its initial state is reached. Since the work and heat transfer involve a change in the surroundings, the surroundings are not restored to their initial state, indicating that the unrestrained expansion was an irreversible process. The process described in the figure is also an example of an unrestrained expansion, and so is the flow through a restriction like a valve or throttle. In the reversible expansion of a gas, there must be only an infinitesimal difference between the force exerted by the gas and the restraining force, so that the rate at which the boundary moves will be infinitesimal. In accordance with our previous definition, this is a quasi-equilibrium process. However, actual systems have a finite difference in forces, which causes a finite rate of movement of the boundary, and thus the processes are irreversible in some degree. Heat transfer through a finite temperature difference. Consider as a system a high temperature body and a low temperature body, and let heat be transferred from the high temperature body to the low temperature body. The only way in which the system can be restored to its initial state is to provide refrigeration, which requires work from the surroundings, and some heat transfer to the surroundings will also be necessary. Because of the heat transfer and the work, the surroundings are not restored to their original state, indicating that the process is irreversible. An interesting question is now posed. Heat is defined as energy that is transferred through a temperature difference. We have just shown that heat transfer through a temperature difference is an irreversible process. Therefore, how can we have a reversible heat transfer process? A heat transfer process approaches a reversible process as the temperature difference between the two bodies approaches zero. Therefore, we define a reversible heat transfer process as one in which heat is transferred through an infinitesimal temperature difference. We realize, of course, that to transfer a finite amount of heat through an infinitesimal temperature difference would require an infinite amount of time or an infinite area. Therefore, all actual heat transfers are through a finite temperature difference and hence are irreversible, and the greater the temperature difference, the greater the irreversibility. We will find, however, that the concept of reversible heat transfer is very useful in describing ideal processes. Mixing 
figure illustrates the process of mixing two different gases separated by a membrane. When the membrane is broken, a homogeneous mixture of oxygen and nitrogen fills the entire volume, this process will be considered in some detail in chapter 11. We can say here that this may be considered a special case of an unrestrained expansion, for each gas undergoes an unrestrained expansion as it fills the entire volume. An air separation plant requires an input of work to recreate masses of pure oxygen and pure nitrogen. Mixing the same substance at two different states is also an irreversible process. Consider the mixing of hot and cold water to produce lukewarm water. The process can be reversed, but it requires a work input to a heat pump that will heat one part of the water and cool the other part. Having defined the reversible process and considered some factors that make processes irreversible, let us again pose the question raised in section 5.3. If the efficiency of all heat engines is less than 100%, what is the most efficient cycle we can have? Let us answer this question for a heat engine that receives heat from a high temperature reservoir and rejects heat to a low temperature reservoir. Since we are dealing with reservoirs, we recognize that both the high temperature and the low temperature of the reservoirs are constant and remain constant regardless of the amount of heat transferred. Let us assume that this heat engine which operates between the given high temperature and low temperature reservoirs, does so in a cycle in which every process is reversible. If every process is reversible, the cycle is also reversible, and if the cycle is reversed, the heat engine becomes a refrigerator. In the next section we will show that this is the most efficient cycle that can operate between two constant temperature reservoirs. It is called the Carnot cycle and is named after a French engineer, Nicolas Leonard Sadi Carnot, 1796-1832, who expressed the foundations of the second law of thermodynamics in 1824. We now turn our attention to the Carnot cycle. Figure shows a power plant that is similar in many respects to a simple steam power plant and, we assume, operates on the Carnot cycle. Consider the working fluid to be a pure substance such as steam. Heat is transferred from the high temperature reservoir to the water, steam, in the boiler. For this process to be a reversible heat transfer, the temperature of the water, steam, must be only infinitesimally lower than the temperature of the reservoir. This result also implies, since the temperature of the reservoir remains constant, that the temperature of the water must remain constant. Therefore, the first process in the Carnot cycle is a reversible isothermal process in which heat is transferred from the high temperature reservoir to the working fluid. A change of phase from liquid to vapor at constant pressure is, of course, an isothermal process for a pure substance. The next process occurs in the turbine without heat transfer and is therefore adiabatic. Since all processes in the Carnot cycle are reversible, this must be a reversible adiabatic process, during which the temperature of the working fluid decreases from the temperature of the high temperature reservoir to the temperature of the low temperature reservoir. In the next process, heat is rejected from the working fluid to the low temperature reservoir. This must be a reversible isothermal process in which the temperature of the working fluid is infinitesimally higher than that of the low temperature reservoir. During this isothermal process some of the steam is condensed. The final process, which completes the cycle, is a reversible adiabatic process in which the temperature of the working fluid increases from the low temperature to the high temperature. If this were to be done with water, steam, as the working fluid, a mixture of liquid and vapor would have to be taken from the condenser and compressed. This would be very inconvenient in practice, and therefore in all power plants the working fluid is completely condensed in the condenser. The pump handles only the liquid phase, since the Carnot heat engine cycle is reversible, every process could be reversed, in which case it would become a refrigerator. The refrigerator is shown by the dotted arrows. And text. The temperature of the working fluid in the evaporator would be infinitesimally lower than the temperature of the low temperature reservoir, and in the condenser, it would be infinitesimally higher than that of the high temperature reservoir. It should be emphasized that the Carnot cycle can, in principle, be executed in many ways. Many different working substances can be used, such as a gas or a substance. With a phase change, as described in Chapter 1. 
there are also various possible arrangements of machinery. For example, a Carnot cycle can be devised that takes place entirely within a cylinder, using a gas as a working substance, as shown in figure. The important point to be made here is that the Carnot cycle, regardless of what the working substance may be, always has the same four basic processes. These processes are 1. A reversible isothermal process in which heat is transferred to or from the high temperature reservoir. 2. A reversible adiabatic process in which the temperature of the working fluid decreases from the high temperature to the low temperature. 3. A reversible isothermal process in which heat is transferred to or from the low temperature reservoir. 4. A reversible adiabatic process in which the temperature of the working fluid increases from the low temperature to the high temperature.